you're gonna, you know, have power. Yeah. The beauty of it is it didn't require gasoline. You could use coal, wood, any available fuel to make steam and you had power. Mm -hmm. That was the beauty of it. So if you hooked up, th this is where the steam would go? Yep. yep. So if you just put some... Mm -hmm. Are the little arrows going across? Yep. And it's rolling right in front of me too. What treasure do you have in there? This is uh, a quart, a replica that I built of a quarter scale Bentley BR2 rotary aircraft engine. This was the engine used in the Sopwith, um, the Sopwith Camel and the Sopwith Snipe, which is a British World War I fighter plane. You know what I could do? I could put some newspaper down and set it up here. All right. We're rolling. This is this is the quarter scale replica. It's pretty much in detail, right down to the last uh, spark plug, you might say. It's got dual spark plugs, rollerized rockers. I wound my own valves. Everything is pretty much just like the original. It's got uh, aluminum cylinders. Each cylinder has a cast iron sleeve. Um, the cam mechanism inside is exactly like the original. E every part is made just like the original. There's probably close to 5,000 parts if you want to count out every nut and bolt. And it's... Uh, well, you made them all, didn't you? I made them all. It took me about 1,500 hours to build it. Now, this is a rotary. Now, what a lot of people don't understand what a rotary is, that the crankshaft this piece back here which bolts right to the aircraft just like it's bolted to this stand and when the engine runs the entire engine revolves like so and the crankshaft stays still and the reason they built an engine like that was when you build an engine of this design the pistons don't reciprocate they merely rotate therefore there was no need to counterbalance a piston with a weight so you eliminated all your counterbalance weights in the engine which made the engine lighter uh, there again the drawback was that the whole engine had to rotate but at that period they were only flying about 60 miles an hour and they needed that spinning action to cool the engine with air striking the, each cylinder now I'm wondering if I could What's the name of the engine again? It, it's called the Bentley BR2. Uh, it was designed by W. Bentley, who built the Bentley automobile, which later sold out to Rolls-Royce. Um, and he, he was the chief engineer on the project, and that's why they named it after him. Um, if I get a little... Did you make your own spark plugs? Yeah, I made the spark plugs. What about the ceramic part? How in the world did you manage that? The spark plugs are made from a piece of ceramic tubing that's used in the electrical industry. And I use Loctite to hold it to the bodies, which I machined up from regular round bar stock. Mm -hmm. There you go. There's, this is one of them. I machined the bodies up in the lathe. This piece of wire comes from a, an old hair dryer which is nichrome wire. I can't see. Okay. You're going to lose the focus oh, if you yeah. get too close. Yeah. Okay, I think we can see now. Can and you see it? Then I slipped a piece of Teflon tubing over it and turned up a small brass piece and soldered it on the end of the nichrome wire. Mm -hmm. But uh, they work pretty good. It's got a quarter 32 thread and it's pretty close to being quarter scale. It's actually a bit larger than what it should be, but it's a lot easier to make this size. You start to make a spark plug much smaller than that, it becomes very, very troublesome. A bit like this. In fact, making them this size... There you go. In fact, making them this size is enough trouble. Uh, this is one of the intake valves. You get a big picture? Made out of stainless steel. Mm -hmm. This is a cylinder head that's machined from the solid. These got quite dirty. I've got them coated with something so they won't rust. Needless to say, all the dust sticks to them. This is an extra head that I made while I was set up the machining procedures. 
Uh, also got a cylinder here, so you can give you an idea what the inside of the engine looks like. This is an extra that I had made. Had a little accident when I first started it. I didn't have enough piston to wall clearance, and I had a seizure take place, and that's where this piston got damaged. But it, it gives you an idea of what the inside of the engine looks like and how big the pistons are. Each cylinder is made out of aluminum, turned from bar stock, and the cast iron sleeve was turned from a piece of cast iron bar stock, and it turned to a very thin dimension, pressed in with a small shoulder, and the cylinder head is held on to it and seals at this point held on with the four bolts you see right here um, show you the back of the engine this is what is designed to look like a magneto in reality there's contact points in there that trigger this this remotely mounted coil which goes through this wire there are two of them because it's dual ignition. This is an oil pump that runs off of a gear inside here and it winds up with a 16 to 1 ratio between the, the small miniature piston is a piston of an eighth of an inch in diameter with an eighth of an inch stroke that operates a pump that pumps castor oil into the crankcase to lubricate the main bearings from there it gets thrown to the outside and lubricates the pistons and this system is called a loss lubrication system because what happens to the oil is uh, the fuel enters through the carburetor which is on the end of the crankshaft this is the carburetor which by the way is sitting pretty much between the pilot's legs in the aircraft because this is the firewall at this point the pilot would sit about here with this between his legs and the air and fuel enter into the same crank sh case as the oil is in. Now the air and gas mixture goes up through this intake manifold to the intake valve, gets burnt in the combustion chamber and th comes out the exhaust. That's the extent of the exhaust system right there. Now enough to hold the valve. What happens is Yes, that's exactly what it is. It's a cage just big enough to hold the exhaust valve stem. That's it. Now what happens is the uh, same oil that lubricates it is impossible to stop it from going through. So what happens is the oil goes up through the combustion process. Most of it doesn't even burn. It gets thrown from the engine. Uh, that's why you always saw the pilot wearing these goggles. And when he got down, he had oil all over his face. And everybody thinks that that towel... Well, that the scarf, scarf right. that they wore was a scarf, but in reality it was a towel to wipe the oil off his face. So this engine uses what they call a loss lubrication system. And uh, it, could be, it could be pretty messy. Is it a lot different than mixing the oil and gas? Yes, because you take a snowmobile or any one of those machines, it use you would mix the oil and the gas and the oil that was mixed with the gas that went through the crankcase of a two cycle now you gotta remember this is four cycle unlike okay, a two yeah. cycle uh, a lot of people think if you mix the oil and the gas together it's automatically a two cycle well that's not what determines a two cycle and a four cycle this uses castor oil now castor oil will not mix with gasoline it's not a petroleum based product it's derived from the castor bean mm -hmm. so what happens is the oil goes through the same crankcase as the air and gas, but they never mix. The oil stays all clung to the parts it has to lubricate. Some of it gets carried along with it in small little globlets, and it goes up through the combustion process and thrown from the engine in the same fashion into a mist. And uh, they never really mix. They go through the same engine. Yeah. But the reason they did that is they didn't want the gasoline washing off the lubricant that was stuck on all the internal parts. Um, I can't say by mixing it like a two-stroke, today's two-strokes, I don't know how well that would work, to be honest with you. I haven't tried it. I've been pleased with the way this works, so that's why I left it. Plus, it's, it's the way the original one was, and the intent was to build a replica of the original engine. And you had a propeller for it, too, didn't you? Yeah, I have a propeller.
You still got that in focus? Yeah. Yeah, that's focusing. Why do you have these tipped? So you can see it. It disappears. Uh -huh. See this white line? Oh, it turns so, you so don't fast. Put your this, hand yeah, it turns so fast you can't see it. Mm -hmm. It's almost a full screen spark plug. That's focused? Yeah. Well, what are you doing to get it to focus? Holding down the macro button and. Oh, you got to hold it. Yeah. I'm sort of using the zoom as a focus. Oh, you got to hold it down. That explains it. This is the propeller. No, it doesn't focus. Well, you had it for a little while. Oh, look at that. It pushes those little things back. Well, it's, this is a washer. This is supposed to come off, and this goes on, and all these bolts go through this. Oh, uh -huh. And that's how it's held so on. So the washer's just there to keep everything intact? Well, it's a drive washer. The washer is splined to the, to the shaft yet. So it becomes a drive washer, just like the back one. So it drives through these bolts. The entire torque of the engine is is putting power. Now you got to remember that this here is quarter scale, and it measures 26 and something like 13 sixteenths. The original one was over nine feet long. But when they'd start this thing, they they would have to grab that propeller and the entire engine and spin the whole business. It's quite a feat to start this thing. In fact, this one was one of the biggest rotaries that were built. And it was start with, started with what they call a huck starter. It was a big tripod mounted on the front of a truck with a belt going up to it. And they'd come in with a long shaft and connect here and spin the engine over from another engine. Because it was a tough one to start. Uh, you said it used gasoline for sure? Yep. It runs on gasoline lubricated by castor oil. The tank here has a baffle in it, and this is a castor oil tank, and this here, from here to here, is the gasoline. This is my shutoff. This is a fuel mixture, and this is the slide-type carburetor. I could put a coil. So the pilot could He could throttle this one. The early ones were not throttleable. They used to control the speed of the engine by killing the ignition. This particular one, yeah, when they would start it up, it was going wide open. So if they were going too fast, they would push the button and we'd shut the motor off. And because of its rotating mass, it's its own giant flywheel, it would coast for 30 seconds. Then before it would completely stop, they would let go, so it would pick up a little more speed, then they'd kill it again. That's how they controlled the speed. Mm. When they come in for a Got landing. A chance, isn't it? Well, that's when they used to fly by the seat of their pants. They would actually come in for a landing, and to slow up the airspeed, they would kept killing the engine until they got the speed they wanted, and then they'd set it down. Mm -hmm. Then before it would stall, they'd blip it, and then make a turn, and then taxi down the runway. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of wood do you use for the propeller? Poplar. It's lightweight, isn't it? Yeah, I use poplar because it's easy to cast. It's, it's six pieces of quarter-inch poplar all glued together. Mm -hmm. And you can see where it's been glued here with epoxy type glue. And that's what gives it this little line right mm -hmm. here. That's each piece, see? Mm -hmm. Wow. Had to make the templates to uh, carve it every two inches. There was a template. It bolts to like a two by four or a known surface. And you work from that surface. Now there's a set of templates for this side. And there's also a set of templates for this side. See, the propeller has an airfoil to it. See the curve? Yeah. So what it's doing is, as it's rotating, what it's doing is it's creating a low pressure area right here, which is actually pulling this way. Atmospheric pressure is pushing here because you've lowered the, the pressure by creating an airfoil here, just like a wing on an airplane. Mm -hmm. A spinning wing. Yep. But that's the... Oh yeah? yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure he'll be. You can show him these film, this this footage here, and uh, he'll probably be able to relate to it. Yeah, plus he works on small engines all the time, so he's got good concept of how they work. Yeah, I'm not sure what the problem is. So what are you going to stimulate here? 
Do you want to have a bench? So you're going to use a current to do what? For the spark. For the spark? This is some remotely mounted coils. I haven't mastered the art of rewinding a quarter scale coil. That'll be fun. Although some guys have. <laughs> coil wire is pretty fine, full size. So you had to machine tools to make some of these parts, didn't you? I machined many tools. I've got a box over there under the bench I could spend two, three hours showing you how I made them and what they do. And I bet it took a good bit of patience to put this together. Well, it took about 1,500 hours over a period of two years. Mm -hmm. Well, I haven't started this. A full work here is 2,000 hours. It's a lot of spare time. Yeah. Some weeks I worked more on this than I did at work. If I work 40 hours at work, I'd work 35 and 40 here. Yeah. I'd come out here to. in the evening at 6 o'clock and I'd work till 11, 11.30, five days a week. Then on Saturday, I'd be out here for 18 hours, 16 hours, and then Sunday, the same thing. <laughs> so, I was having fun. So if anybody needed to talk to you, they had to come out to the, to the garage, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, you get on a roll. You ever been on a roll oh, with sure. something and you get going good? Uh-huh. And, uh, you just want to keep going. Yeah, this fuel, you just how to run. How are you going to spin it with no prop? Um, I just push the engine. Oh yeah. It 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 doesn't need a prop because it's there's so much flywheel action. Yeah. Throw the ignition on. I do like it. Uh, A little bit. Like I say, it throws oil. And what I had <laughs> done, I washed it down before I put it away, and I coat it with uh, penetrating oil so it doesn't rust. And so, needless to say, when you start it, the first thing it does is throw everything Spews off. Spews of it. it everywhere. Yeah. But it came alive pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it sure did, and it was smooth. Well, it's very smooth because nothing in the engine reciprocates. What was the size of the original engine roll? It was a uh, nine cylinder. It was 25,000 cc's, which just translates. Wait, 25,000? 25,000 cc's. It translates to about 1,500 cubic inches. Now just picture three 454 Chevys. Yeah. Right? That's basically how big the engine was. Or 1020 compact cars. <laughs> So, it gives you an idea how big the original one was. It developed 235 horsepower, which is not a lot with today's standards on horsepower, but back then, that was a lot of power. When you stop and think that the average aircraft engine had somewhere in the vicinity of 35, 40 horsepower. This is 235. I mean, that's like a today's, the relationship is like, Today's F-16, right? <laughs> wow, yeah. So, in any case, the uh, this one is 
being quite a scale, scales down to 347 cc's. Now you say, well, geez, that's, you stop and think about it, take a 350 Honda, right, and take a, you can see how much smaller this engine is because it utilizes one crankshaft journal because it has a master rod with a whole series of rods tying into it. Unlike a two-cylinder or four-cylinder engine would have to have a crank and a journal for each piston, makes the engine longer. This engine is much more compact. So, you know, you stop to think, 350 cc out of an engine this big, that's, that's pretty good, too. So. And this one's portable. Well, yeah, this, one, <laughs> this one's portable, all right. Uh, I knew it was going to throw a Most of it is thrown down and out. That's the slipstream. It throws it this way. That's why I think most of it went that way. I'm glad it wasn't on your ceiling. Well, it probably is. Because the last time I ran it, I did get oil up there. Unless that person is well versed in in how machines generally... Everything I own is covered with castor oil. Castor oil, that's what they used to give the kids. That's exactly what it is. Like in, like in... Uh, Banky in our gang. Yep. Remember there was a kid out with the alarm clock would go off and the kid had to eat gas for Well, what it did was oh. the two planes. That's a slide type carburetor slide with a tapered needle. Very much like a Walbro or a SU carburetor. Something you'd see maybe on a motorcycle. Yeah, snowmobile. Snowmobile, yeah. The principle is good. If you can point. Okay. Well, what I could do is shut it off here. I can, I can stop and I can switch. All right. What it is is this is the center for the connecting rods, like I spoke of. This would be the crank pin. This is called a master rod, this particular one, which is number one, which is fixed solid to this round ring. All the others come in here and tie in with a small wrist pin. And they're allowed to flex at this point. And they're also allowed to flex here. Now the way this works is, this being offset, as you can see the piston is at the top of the cylinder when it's at the top, and at the bottom, when it's at the bottom of the cylinder. Compression takes place here. And you'll notice that every other cylinder fires. That's the reason for the odd number of cylinders. There's nine in this engine. But yeah. what happens is, being a four cycle, it needs two complete revolutions of the engine to go through all four cycles. The intake stroke, the compression stroke, the power stroke, and the exhaust stroke. Now, th this is accomplished in this engine just like it would be in most any other engine. But every other cylinder, while this cylinder here is on the power stroke, the one adjacent to it is on the exhaust intake stroke. And what it does is if you fire every other cylinder, being an odd number, two revolutions, you fire them all. Now, down here, you have the cam mechanism, which is a little more complicated. This would be virtually impossible to explain without showing you how it works. Can you make it run slower at all? Well, I can do it this way. This is the lobe. This particular thing is made double scale. This would actually be half this size mounted in the front. Now, there are two of these. That's the reason for the the offset in the engine here. The ones on the outer side operate the exhaust valve and the ones on the inner side operate the intake valve. Now this particular piece here is just a slice of one of these. There are two stacked on top of each other timed in such a way that they open the valve at the correct time. Now the way this works is unlike a conventional camshaft it has a gear that operates inside of another gear. Now, this gear has 16 teeth. This gear has 18 teeth. 
That means every revolution of this engine, this cam moves ahead by two teeth. Now this has four lobes on the gear. Now what happens is this lobe operates this lifter, which is lit opening, you can see the space here, it's opening the valve. This is connected to the push rod, which in turn is connected to the valve. Now, as this, as this rotates, you can see what happens here. The valve closes at the bottom. Now we're going to come up with this cylinder. We're going to go to the compression stroke, power stroke. So on the power stroke, the engine, this valve has to stay closed. So it, at this revolution, it missed. There's no lobe opposite this particular one, so the valve stayed closed. Now, the next revolution of the engine, th the valve is going to have to operate because its turn for the intake exhaust stroke takes place. Now, this lobe moves over to operate this valve. The last time, it was operated by this lobe. But meanwhile, it's operating a lobe or a lifter or a valve in another uh, portion of the engine. There again, as you can see, this one would be on the intake exhaust stroke. The two cylinders adjacent to it are on their power stroke. Every other cylinder is in an opposite phase cycle. Mm. So it takes eight revolutions of the engine before the same lobe comes back to operate the same valve. Meanwhile, it's operating a, another valve in the engine, which is very different than a conventional camshaft. A camshaft has a lobe which operates the same valve over and over and over, whereas this one is actually moving around or dancing around in the engine, operating various lobes. But the whole thing comes together and it works. Awesome. The lights depict the firing order. Fires at the top, power stroke down, exhaust stroke pushes everything out, sucks in a new charge, compresses it again, fires. Did you follow that? Yeah. Yeah, is he holding his hand in front of it so you can't no. see? No. No? Yeah, we'll do another one here. Let's we'll start with the intake. Intake stroke sucks in a charge, compresses the charge, fires it. The explosion pushes it down, it pushes the old gas out, sucks in a new charge, pushes it out, fires it, sucks, uh, pushes the old charge out. Now that, the phase is opposite with the adjacent cylinders. That's why you see every other cylinder is firing. But in two revolutions, it's back to back to where one. it was. Yeah, just like a regular engine with a four. The four cycle principle is the same. The thing that's different is the fact that it's a rotary and the engine is revolving. Who designed it? Again, who is? This, it's the... Bentley? Bentley, uh, W. Bentley, William Bentley, that, that designed the Bentley automobile. He was a young engineer working for Vickers of England at the time, which was about eight, 1915. And this particular project, he was the chief engineer on the project, so what he did, they named the particular engine after him. He's not credited for everything on this engine. He's credited for using aluminum cylinders and uh, aluminum pistons because prior to that, nobody was using aluminum on pistons and cylinders, and they all had overheating problems. So he knew that the pistons, because he was involved at uh, auto racing, he knew that the aluminum would dissipate heat much better, and it was much lighter. So he, he chose to use it, and it was very successful. Uh, shortly after that, most everything was made out of uh, aluminum. Uh, he later went on to design and build a Bentley automobile, which was sold out to Rolls-Royce, and everybody's familiar with the Bentley when you talk about the Bentley. Mm -hmm. But this was earlier in his, uh, his years. This particular engine was a spin-off from a French cliché. Uh, if you look at a, a cliché, it's very similar to this engine. In fact, this mechanism he thought was so good, he didn't change it one bit. He used this identical arrangement. This particular, uh, the engine was quite different up in here, the way that the valves and the uh, intake manifold run or ran. But it was the last of the rotaries. Shot of, shortly after this, they became obsolete because they could build the engine so light, there was no need, and they were, they were able to cool it because they were using aluminum, there was no need to spin the engine. So now they started to produce radial engines, 
which is an engine that sits stationary and this crank pin revolves around like this and causes the pistons to go back and forth in the cylinder which is the way all uh, radial or I should say yeah radial engines are built today but this here you gotta remember is a rotary and being rotary the entire engine rotates what's the advantage of the radial over the rotary this suffered from two major problems one was the lubrication if the engine rotates, you do not have an up and a down or a left and a right to the engine. It's completely symmetrical. So there's no place for the oil to gather so that you can repump it and use it in the engine. That's why it used the lost lubrication system. The lost lubrication system would literally sling the oil due to centrifugal force into the cylinders to lubricate them. Uh, there's a problem getting the fuel to it. They had to feed it in through the crankcase, which caused uh, the two to mix and get thrown from the engine. So that was a big problem. The other problem was the gyroscopic kick. The pilots we called it that. It's actually the gyroscopic effect or the flywheel effect of the engine. Now you've got an engine that weighs about let's say 500 pounds which is probably as much as the entire airplane weighed. So when you would accelerate the engine the torque from the engine wanted to spin the plane in the opposite direction. Now unless you counteracted with a force off of the elevators to, uh, to counteract this force it would literally spin the airplane around and it was a very difficult plane to fly till you learned how to coordinate the throttle and the rudder because every time you would throttle it up it wanted to spin the plane very much like a helicopter Today's helicopters uh, all work in the same fashion. When you accelerate a helicopter, it wants to, you're applying as much torque to the helicopter, so the entire helicopter wants to spin the other way. So that's why they put a tail on it with a spinning propeller, and that propeller has to vary the pitch of that propeller either to take a big bite or a little bite of air in order to compensate for the torque that's being applied to the helicopter. It all sounds easy, but to coordinate the two was quite difficult. Uh, the pilot had to feel the plane and compensate, and they lost a lot of pilots on takeoff. He would accelerate the thing, and the torque would be applied to the plane who wanted to lift the tail, and they would bring the tail right up and crash the plane. So, you got to remember, 1915, you know, and they. The, uh, there were other rotaries built prior to this. The French were great for building rotaries. They had the Gnome, and another one was the, I see the Gnome, and the, well, Cligé was another one. Mono Super Pop. That was one that used a valve in the top of the piston head, and the fuel was